Howdy and welcome to the 10 Week Bible Study. This is week three, day three of our study of the book of John. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about John 5, 31 through 47. And I'm freezing. I love the snow. I love the snow so much. It's gorgeous. I just love it. If I jumped into that river, Clarence the angel's gonna have to do more than just rescue me. I'm like a kid when it snows. This is so beautiful. How peaceful and serene. Such a cool thing. I mean, not like cool, like funny, haha. -ha. It's neat. I like it. I'm at the Red Bridge in South Kansas City. Never have figured out why they named Don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon to be notified when new videos are uploaded. This is a five day a week Bible study to encourage you in your walk with God. I pray that this will give you the extra oomph that you need to get over that hump so many people struggle with as they study the Bible. They get a little bogged down, a little lost, and I hope this will be that catalyst that helps you get moving in a consistent way studying God's Word. Let's go ahead and pray before we start today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your Word has to say to us. God, speak to us. Come and touch us today and fill us with your knowledge and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's Word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is John chapter 5, starting in verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony is true about me. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. What Jesus is referencing here is a command in Deuteronomy 19, I believe, that <clears throat> you can't establish anything unless it's by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so Jesus here is saying, listen, my testimony is true, because I testify, I'm one testimony here, and God the Father, the one who sent me, he didn't say that explicitly, but it's implied, God the Father is the other one. We are the two witnesses. But he's, he's telling them this because he understands you're not going to accept God the Father as my other testimony because you don't actually know him. <laughs> That's what he's going to get at here. You don't know him, so you're not actually going to accept his testimony about me because you're not going to believe anything that he says because you don't talk to him. So he moves on to another human, and he says, even John, and he's meaning John the Baptist, you accepted his testimony. He testified about me. So here I am, one human. John the Baptist is the second human, so my testimony is valid because two witnesses have established this. But Jesus makes it very clear. I don't accept human testimony. I don't need your testimony. I don't even want your testimony. But he says, for your sake, so that you will actually believe me, so that you will look into the matter and investigate it, so that you can be saved. I'm telling you that John is corroborating what I'm saying from a legal standpoint. That's how their minds worked. And so he's giving them everything they need. Now, we know that most of the Pharisees, most of the teachers of the law at that time, they didn't care who said what about Jesus. They didn't really actually care about the two witnesses and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't what they were what they were uh, concerned about. They just didn't like Jesus because he didn't honor them and he's doing all these things. There, there's so many reasons we'll get into as we go along, but they just didn't like him. And so it didn't matter who testified what about him, they were going to reject it out of hand. Moving on into verse 36. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has himself testified concerning me. You <clears throat> have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Pause right there before we move on to this next line. 
He's coming right at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the rabbis of, of that day. These guys, he's saying, you don't know God. You don't know the Father. That's the only reason I'm saying John testified about me. But the problem is John testified about God as well. And you don't receive any of that because you don't know him. You've rejected him. You're far from him. I mean, <clears throat> here's the truth of everyone. No one has seen his form. John actually starts the book of John with this truth. No one at any time has ever seen God. And that brings us back to that paradox that he introduces in chapter 1. If no one's ever seen him, yet we saw Jesus and Jesus is God, how is it that no one's ever seen God but we see Jesus and, oh man, it racks your brain. And it forces you to, to wrestle with this idea of instead of trying to figure God out, you come to him and say, I don't get it. Can you please explain this to me, Jesus? I really don't understand how all this works. <clears throat> it's above my pay grade. I tell the Lord all the time that it's above my pay grade. I don't get it. Can you please help me? We've got to, to go into that humility. We've got to be, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, you know, uh, I, I kid with my wife all the time and I tell her, I am so incredibly proud of how humble I am. Wink, wink, hint, hint. <clears throat> if, if you're proud of how humble you are, you aren't. It was, that was all tongue in cheek in case you didn't catch it. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on. These guys don't know God. That's the point. Verse 39, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. This is one of the scariest passages in all of scripture. That there are these people that day and night, they set themselves to study the word of God. They're looking through it. They're combing through it, looking to glean any little nugget of truth and understanding they can out of it. And they search the scriptures. I mean, they're looking for things because they think in them they have eternal life. But in reality, eternal life was standing in front of them. And they wanted to kill him. This is a sobering passage because what we're doing here in this Bible study is we're studying the Bible. And in what we're doing, we actually can't find life. I encourage you to study God's Word. I encourage you to study, to read this book once a week for 10 weeks, the book of John, as we're going through this. Fill your mind with this book. You can't get enough of this book. That wasn't the Pharisees' problem. Pharisees' problem was that this was their end. It wasn't their means to an end. This book right here was their end. It's what their life was about. As much as I love this book and love the words of this book, this book is not the end that I'm going for. A relationship with God. Intimacy with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's what I want for me and that's what I want for you. This book is a means to an end. This book is just, if you can see it here, red and black words on a page. Ink printed on paper that was manufactured. This has no power Unless, as we're reading it, we encounter the living word. That's why John introduces that first paradox in this book. Is that Jesus and the word are one and the same. If we study this and we don't see Jesus, we don't know Jesus, we don't hear his heart, we don't come to know and, and love him more, then we haven't actually read his word. We've read words on a page, but we've not read the word. We've not read his words. And it is entirely possible, and that's terrifying to me. I never want to find myself in a place of pride where I've got this figured out. 
I don't want to be your Bible teacher guru and come to you with all the answers. Yes, I've studied. Yes, I've read lots of stuff, and I love relaying that to you, and I, I hope and pray that you can learn from this, but I don't want to be your guru here. I don't have all the answers. That's one of the reasons I, I'm happy we're starting this YouTube Bible study series with the book of John, because this book really does bring up more questions than answers. These paradoxes are designed to force you to wrestle with deeper questions so that you will come to the one with the answers. Not to me, not to some other Bible teacher, but to the one who spoke and wrote these words, the living word, Jesus. He can give you the answers. And unless we do that, unless coming to the living word is the, the end that we're looking for, then the Bible becomes our end and it becomes a dead book of ink on paper. This is useless unless it's a means to an end to know God more. This is the only thing it can accomplish. Anything other than that is a waste. Don't waste your life. Read this book as a means to an end, a means to knowing God for yourself, having a relationship with him. Verse 41, <clears throat> I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Here Jesus is basically pointing out to them. That they've kind of been asking Jesus, where did you study? Where did you learn all these things? Where are you getting this authority from? Because they kind of had a, a, a structure, if you will, kind of a, a university system of sorts where they're the professors and all of the students, they know them. And there aren't any people out there teaching that didn't have to come up through them and learn through their system. So they kind of have put everyone in place. They're the gatekeepers. They're making sure that no one's out there teaching that they didn't give the authority to teach. So they're saying, we're the ones who grant the authority to teach. Where on earth did you get your authority from? Because it didn't come from us. You didn't get it from me, Jesus. So who gave you the right to come speaking on these things that we're the only ones who have authority to grant? And Jesus is like, you don't actually have that authority. My father, he's actually the one with that authority, not you. You've taken that uh, on yourselves and, and you're wrong. And what he's saying is you basically, you, you accept one another. You grant each other authority and this is this big, you know, love fest amongst yourselves, but it has nothing to do with me or my father. So your system, he's saying, is completely broken because you honor each other. But when I stand in front of you, the God made flesh, you don't honor me. And that's a problem. You don't recognize God when he's standing in front of you and you can look into his eyes. That's tragic. Verse 45. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Jesus is coming right back at them with the law. He says, you don't believe in God, and it doesn't even matter, because he's not going to accuse you. I don't even have to accuse you. This comes all the way back to this whole idea of judgment that we're going back and forth. You know, Jesus is... I, you know, God doesn't judge, I judge. Well, actually, you know, it's not me that judges, it's really Moses that's going to judge you. His words are your judge. You're going to live and die. You're going to, to rise or fall by the words of Moses. And so this issue of judgment, again, is just this paradoxical thing where unless we know him, unless we know the judge, fully understanding the judgment is really difficult. But here he's saying it doesn't even take God the Father or me to judge you. Moses, whom, you know, they're looking through this law, looking through the words of Moses himself, trying to find life, and they don't recognize the true author of the words of Moses, Jesus. And he says, 
Moses, this one that you study day and night that you give yourself to, he's going to be your judge. You are going to be judged by Moses and he is going to be your accuser. And I don't think this is just Jesus being figurative. I think that there's coming a day where all of these religious big heads, people that think that they know and understand these things and teach all sorts of nonsense that lock people's hearts, and this still goes on today. I think that Jesus is actually at the judgment seat. He's going to say, hey, I don't have to judge these. Moses, you can step in and your own words will judge these guys. I, I think he's being very literal there. That's just my take on it. I, I think there's coming a day where God is not going to have to judge certain of these religious types. He's actually going to let Moses literally do it. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The point is that Moses' words, the law, judges them. And what's so tragic about it is it's the very thing they've given their life to studying, to being about and they've missed it. So we have to understand that as we study this, as we read through this, it's possible for us to miss it. So humility, humility above everything else, above how many commentaries you've read and where you studied at and what your seminary was, what, none of that matters. What matters the most is do you come at this with a heart of humility because God said he's far from the proud but he's close to the humble. And we're going to see that over and over again in this book. I pray that you will join me in asking the Lord to give us the humility to accept every single word that he speaks. Because this book, the book of John, as we read through it, if it doesn't offend you, if there's at least not just one part of this book that doesn't offend you, you didn't read it right, try it again. Because there is something in the book of John that's going to hit you and be like, I don't know about that, I don't like that. Because John is using the words of Jesus, he's, 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 he's curating different parts of Jesus' ministry for a purpose in this book to attack every single thing in our life that would set itself up against the knowledge of God. And it is so vitally important that we set our knowledge of God based on what John says, not based on what we want. I want this book to bring me to Jesus so that when I meet him, I won't say, you don't look like the God that I've created in my own mind and heart. You don't look like the Jesus that I've constructed myself. I want to come to him and say, oh, that's what you look like. Wow. I want to be in awe of who he is, not frustrated and let down by who I thought he was going to be. And that's what this book is about. Thanks for joining me on the 10-week Bible study. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I'll be back tomorrow with another episode.